Welcome to our Sustainably Wed Head Table series. In this series, we are talking with experts about how to make the wedding and event industry more sustainable. And today we're talking about climate change. We realized that we put together seven episodes about sustainability in the event industry, but we never actually really talked about climate change. So that's what we're going to do today. We're gonna to talk about how to make this industry more resilient, how climate change will impact our industry, and why this work is so urgent. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Lekwungen speaking people, and the Wasanich people. And we're also very lucky to be filming today at the Beach House. I know our set looks the same as it did in the other episodes, but if you looked out that way, which you cannot, you'd see the ocean. Uh, the Beach House is a lovely wedding and event venue um, and a great community gathering space. We're really happy to be here. Now, speaking of lucky, uh, we are so lucky to have Greg Flato here. Greg, um, you have an incredible resume. So Greg is a climate scientist and uh, executive with Environment and Climate Change Canada. You're an adjunct professor with the University of Victoria. Um, Greg has authored so many papers about climate change and specializes in climate change modeling, prediction, um, and projections. Greg, thank you so much for being here. Well, it's my pleasure. Now, to my right here, uh, we are very lucky to have Chrisanne or Charlie Lake. Uh, Chrisanne is just this incredible wedding officiant uh, who we've had the opportunity to work with uh, a number of times. Um, you are not only a wedding officiant with Young, Hip and Married, uh, Chrisanne is uh, just, she's got an incredible resume with humanitarian organizations, uh, environmental NGOs, including Habitat for Humanity and Surfrider, which we are going to talk about in another episode. And you work with the University of Victoria as well. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. I, I actually teach a course uh, at uh, Continuing Studies with UVic, so we are all yes, UVic buddies. All yeah, oh, wow. yeah, 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 UVic, yeah. Who are not sponsoring this episode, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but we are UVic friends. So let's talk about climate change. Okay, so, so Greg, this might sound like a silly question, but I think it is important to start this conversation with kind of shared terms, shared understanding of, of what we're talking about here. So I'm going to ask a very broad question, which is, what is climate change? Okay, well, climate change is, uh, you know, the trivial answer is it's a change in climate. But that means what, it, what is climate and how is it different from weather? The weather is what we get every day. It's a sunny day, it's a cold day, it's rainy, we get a week of warm weather, a week of cold weather. That's the weather. Climate is the, the averages, the characteristics of that weather. So we know that uh, in the wintertime it's typically colder and rainier here, in the summertime it's warmer and drier. That's the annual cycle of, of our climate. We know that the climate in Victoria is different than the climate in Winnipeg. So that's, you know, people have an understanding of what climate means in that sense. And climate change is the change in those characteristics, like the average temperatures and the number of days of rainfall and things, that, that is changing over time. And it's changing over time because of changes in the composition of the atmosphere, mainly the increase of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide that result from fossil fuel consumption. So we know why the climate is changing. We know that it is changing. We observe that it is changing. And it's not just the averages that, that are changing, but the statistics of it, the number of days of really hot weather, the number of days of, of rain, the amount of rain over an annual cycle, those kinds of things are changing. And what that means then is that the risk of certain events, like a heat wave or a flood or a cold spell, are changing. And that affects planning for all kinds of things, including presumably the wedding industry. Absolutely. Well, and that's that leads very smoothly into my next question, which which is about those those um, those really serious events um, and and those unpredictable events. And you, you know, anecdotal anecdotally in the wedding industry, typically we used to see, say, ten years ago, July and August would really be the peak season of our industry. Um, but more and more now, I see shoulder season becoming busier and busier, April and May and September and October. 
And a lot of the reason for that is that people want to avoid those serious climate events like heat domes um, or wildfire smoke. Um, and so we're seeing fewer events happen in, say, August when those heat domes or the, the wildfire smoke happens. So are those events more likely to continue in the future as the climate continues to change? And, and how are they linked to, say, human activity? Yeah, so they, they are indeed uh, occurring, those kind of events are indeed occurring more frequently than they used to. And the way that we often characterize that is in terms of what we call return period. So how, on average, how often would a particular event occur? So uh, an event like, uh, you know, a few days with temperatures above 30 degrees, we might define that as a heat wave. And we might ask, on average, how often would that occur? Once every 10 years, let's say. Well, the thing that used to happen once every 10 years as a consequence of climate change is now happening maybe once every five years. So the risk of those events is, is increasing. So as the temperature warms, the, the likelihood of heat waves increases, the likelihood of fire conditions, you know, dry, hot weather that would lead to forest fires changes, the amount of rainfall changes because a warmer atmosphere can hold more water and therefore there's more available for rain. So all of those extreme events are, are changing and many of them are changing in a way that the, the risk is, is increasing now. Right, okay. So, chris -Ann, I know that we've worked with couples before who have imagined their wedding day uh, and I, certainly I was gu guilty of this. You imagine your wedding day and you imagine it in the sunshine. Um, you don't really picture it in the rain. Um, and, and we've worked with, with couples and clients who um, do not make a rain plan, um, partly because they, they, they just do not want to imagine their day with rain uh, or with a serious weather event. <laughs> so, but you know, as, as we've heard, these serious weather events will continue to happen more frequently and, and they the weather will be less predictable. So how do you recommend that the couples and clients who are planning their wedding imagine their wedding slightly differently so they can be more prepared for these serious weather events? Right. Uh, well, luckily, I was raised with really practical parents who always gave me the advice to plan for the best but prepare for the worst. <laughs> so I know couples might not want to hear that on their wedding day because it is this euphoric state of bliss and that's what train is driving towards but in reality yes I have seen I've been doing weddings for going on 17 years this year and I have been on the west coast of Vancouver Island when there has been uh they've run out of water in Tofino and Euculet I've been in I think it was two summers ago in the Cowichan Valley when it was 44 degrees and I was officiating a wedding and that couple had postponed their wedding from the previous fall and they were all in very long dresses and everyone jumped in the lake afterwards thankfully we were right beside the lake but i think there's just the new reality um we need to be preparing for this so always having a backup plan always i ask every couple i work with and i'm an officiant i'm not necessarily planning the entire wedding or even with them throughout the whole journey of their planning but that's one of the first questions i ask please inform me of your backup plans um, just to get them thinking about it if they haven't. And knowing that um, the last couple of years we've been forced outside to start holding weddings outside, whether, you know, small or medium-sized weddings, whatever we were allowed to gather. And that situation is also something we need to prepare for with the, the smoky uh, smoke in the air and um, just as you were saying, the heat as well. So always, you know, just thinking about what it might look like if we continue to have um, you know, health mandates, or we continue to have these things that were, um, have been very, very on our radar the last couple of years. But always, yes, plan for the best. We, we want to believe it for you. And believe me, I've been in many weddings, probably four that I can think of off the top of my head, where it's been raining, and all of a sudden, as soon as they start saying their vows, the clouds part, and the sun streams out, and rainbows, and it, it's ridiculous how beautiful it is. And that is a thing, and yeah, I want to believe that for every couple, but being practical, being realistic, I would, you know, yes, plan for the best, but prepare for the worst and just have a backup plan. Totally. I mean, not, not to mention that, that rain can actually, as you say, be quite romantic, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I swear that every sitcom wedding ever has been rained out. 
Like yeah. when you think about sitcom, I, I, I'm sure they're all rainy. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, yeah, they're super romantic all the time, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of reshaping our mental image of, of what that day looks like um, is, is super important for sure. Now, obviously, sunshine on your wedding day is a great thing, um, but it's not the only impact of climate change, right? <laughs> there are some more serious things going on here. And, and, and one of those things is um, things like supply chain um, and, and kind of these global networks we have seen be impacted um, over the past couple of years in particular. Uh, and I think we're seeing those shifts more often now. So Greg, can you, can you tell us a little bit about how, say, global su supply change might be impacted by climate change and, and what that might mean for us, say, here on Vancouver Island? Yeah, well, it, it is indeed the case that global supply chains, the, the vulnerability of our global supply chain and our global economy has been has been revealed, particularly during the COVID period, where we see how just how connected everything is. And what that means in terms of, of climate change is when when a severe event like a, a big flood or a typhoon in the in the tropical Pacific uh, hits landfall and damages infrastructure, that that can can have ripple effects everywhere and can alter the, the flow of goods and, and services around the world. More locally, things like the, the big flooding event that we had in the fall of 2021 here in, in, on the Lower Mainland and, and on Vancouver Island clearly disrupted everything locally for a long time. Vancouver was, was completely cut off from highways, roads, pipelines, uh, railways, everything was was closed in and out of Vancouver, and the transportation from the mainland across to the island was was affected in the same way. So, those kind of events, uh, particularly when they impact the transportation infrastructure, uh, can have a, a big effect. Uh, similarly, when we have like the, the the snowfalls that we get in occasionally in Victoria that shut down airports and. You know, if, if you're traveling to, to somewhere for a wedding or a vacation or whatever, those, those have effects. Even when they occur in eastern Canada, those, those events affect us, us everywhere. So climate change does, because it's altering the, the likelihood of those kind of events, does alter the, the risk of, of disruptions in, in things that involve the supply chain, transportation, and so on. Right, right. Now, I, I saw a study recently that, that mentioned that the flooding uh, that you mentioned in, in 2021 um, was at least exacerbated by human activity. Um, can you speak a little bit to how, how like, our relationship with, with the climate um, can create a, a flooding event like that? Yeah, so that's, this is a, a, an area of, of climate science that we, we call event attribution. And that is, we ask, ask the question, how much has the, the likelihood or the risk of a particular event, like that flooding event uh, in 2021, how has that, that likelihood changed as a consequence of human activity, human, uh, cha human cause change of, of the climate system? And we can do that by using historical observations and climate model simulations. And the, the model simulations, these computer simulations of the global climate system that, that the group I'm involved in works on, we can do experiments with those models to ask about the climate, the unperturbed climate, as if humans had not been emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and compare that to the alternate climate, the one that we observe, where we have been putting greenhouse gases and look at the difference. And from that, we can answer that question. And, and so we can determine the, the increased risk of an event like that flooding event now, as opposed to what it would have been if in the alternate world in which humans had not been putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So we can do that for, for a number of events after they occur and demonstrate that humans are are not only affecting the averages of the climate, but also the likelihood of these extremes. Absolutely, that's really cool that we can model that. Um, depressing that that we have to model that, but very cool that that it can be done. It's yeah. it's amazing. Now, I, I want to I want to get back to you know what we as an industry can do to prevent uh, more carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. Um, but before I do. Um, 
let's talk. Let's go back to the the supply chain issue a little bit here and talk about um, say wedding vendors or couples. Uh, we often um, see couples ordering things off say Amazon uh, for their wedding. We see vendors relying on these these global supply chains. Um, so what can we do? Do you think, um, Chrisanne, as as an industry to become less reliant on those and more resilient to these these impacts? Well, you could probably guess that I'm going to say shop local, rent local, buy local as much as you can, um, which I think would, yes, definitely um, be helpful on a lot of levels, um, but mainly just thinking thinking about what is actually necessary. So coming, stepping away from like the consumeristic mentality of quick shopping, like same day delivery type of thing. and. I mean, dare I say, if you can't find it locally, do you really need it? Um, and so there's a lot to consider when we're talking about very serious issues that, that are coming down um, at us in the near future. What is that going to look like for us right now? And I think the main thing is to just stop the planning state um, stage and just think, is this necessary? Do I need this item? And if, if I can't get it local, just no. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's so many folks that are definitely going towards the more DIY if they can't find it, and that's great too. Um, but I know a lot of this stuff is consumeristic and convenient and cheap. So three C's that can be very dangerous. Um, so, but yes, of course, I would say as, as much as we can, um, buy local, support local, and rent local. For sure. Well, it's interesting because we, I mean, we've talked about buying local as vendors throughout many episodes of the series and, and we've talked about it, you know, as the right thing to do to support your local community, um, the, a good thing to do to reduce your carbon footprint. But in this case, we're talking about like making your, your business more resilient um, mm. to these events that are going to happen. So if you're not doing it for those first two reasons, maybe consider it for that. That third reason is that you will be less impacted by these, these events that are going to occur more often, right? Mm. So, yeah. Greg, have you seen other industries shift towards a more sort of climate resilient um, model? And, and how, do, how are other industries dealing with climate change so that when these extreme weather events happen, they're not as impacted? Well, it is certainly the case that, that many industries are, are aware of this and many industries, almost every industry is in one way or another is, is affected by these changes. The industries that we uh, work with, not, not so much directly, we're a research organization, but we, we are closely connected to um, the other parts of our department, Environment and Climate Change Canada, who deliver climate services to, to people. And for example, the industries that we tend to uh, provide support to are things like the, the engineering community who have to design infrastructure, buildings, bridges, highways, municipal wastewater systems, and so on. And they have, those are, that's infrastructure that has a lifetime of many decades. So the design today is, is a design for something that will be in place decades in the future and will be experiencing the climate of the future. And so that industry, for example, is, is a, a big user of climate information. The financial industry, the insurance industry, of course, they they need that kind of information as well to to understand their risks. So we we provide information, both historical climate information based on observations and future information based on these model projections under different greenhouse gas emission scenarios in the future to provide information that that those kind of industries can use to, to make plans for how they could uh, be more resilient to the, these changing events. That's super cool. I love that. I think um, in our industry, we, we probably don't plan like we would plan for a bridge. <laughs> we don't plan to be, you know, uh, 10 years out, 20 years out, 100 years out. Um, but, you know, maybe our businesses should be planning at, at least, um, you know, looking five or 10 years out. And, and I think, you know, COVID certainly showed that uh, for, uh, for our industry. I think it showed a couple of things. And one is that, um, you know, events and gatherings are super important. There, there are significant cultural um, moments and events. And, and, and so they are important, but it also really showed how fragile this industry is, right? And so when we, when we plan for our businesses or our industry to be, you know, where we should be in 10 years or, or 15 or 20 years, how do we plan so that we are a resilient industry and, and we can respond to similar crises coming up. Mm -hmm. 
big question for you. So oh, <laughs> sorry. well, no, I actually was just thinking um, to do with the, the last answer and this question is that I always tell my the couples that I'm officiating for, look beyond your wedding day. So don't just plan for your wedding, plan for your marriage. So looking the same way we should all be looking beyond the day or the year into next year. And I, re I really love that about um, some indigenous teachings that is, is looking seven years ahead and thinking about the generations to come and, and how important that is. So, and I mean, to do with COVID, a lot of, a lot of disruptions. Um, I will say for me, uh, it actually was unique because if being inefficient, um, I actually climbed the ladder of importance, mm -hmm. which was really great before I was somewhere probably just above or maybe still below renting a porta potty. <laughs> it was a kind of an afterthought. Um, but when it came to uh, weddings during COVID, it was like, what do we actually need? Oh, we actually literally need a wedding officiant who can make this all legal. And I don't know, maybe a photographer. So I was yeah. top three. It was, it was such a shift. Um, but yeah, just thinking about um, what we can do, obviously being flexible is a very big deal. And we talk a lot about it. We're talking about resilience. Um, but I, I, I can't be the only person in this industry that went from, I did 20 weddings in 2020, and I did over 100 weddings in 2022. Whoa. So that was a huge shift. But I also know folks that um, sadly had to transition out of their business, and yeah. that's heartbreaking. So I think is going forward for folks in this business and in this industry, um, again, just kind of thinking beyond this year. Um, I was joking about how we, uh, with a friend, just talking about this and trying to remember what the farmer's almanac and the point of that would be to be able to like predict the future. And I'm like, do we need a wedding industry almanac just to be able to like be helpful um, for couples and for us as, um, but yeah, I think the resilience is, there's so many resilient folks in this, not just in the industry, but our couples have been so resilient mm -hmm. and so amazing working with us still. And yeah, but being flexible is key. And, and then having, creating, if not already having, um, a safety net in place, right. whatever that looks like, whether it's um, financially or otherwise. But yeah, definitely having something um, on the back burner. Well, that, I mean, that raises one of the things that we saw really clearly over the past couple of years is that the wedding industry is very um, different in, in all the different types of vendors and, and COVID impacted us differently. And, mm -hmm. and so will um, serious weather events and, and climate change. So um, it's hard to speak about this industry as a whole when, uh, as you say, what you do as an efficient is very different than what a caterer does. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you're going to see those impacts differently. But, um, but you know, thinking about how, how couples can reflect on that as well, I think um, resiliency we've seen a lot of, um, but we've also seen a lot of burnout. Um, and, and I wonder, Greg, you, you, you talk about, you work on models for climate change all, all the time. Um, this can be a depressing uh, subject. This can be a heavy subject. How do you stay optimistic? Um, and, and how can we stay positive and, and feel like we can make a change um, despite uh, all, the, all the change in climate and, and, and science around that? It, it certainly does provoke anxiety and, and worry and fear among people. Uh, but I think one of the things to, to you know, keep thinking positively about is that there are things we can do even as individuals to, to improve the situation. We can, we can think about our energy usage and what we use that energy for and how much we use and where it comes from. We can think about how far we have to drive, how many times a week do we have to drive. You know, vehicles are a big source of, of emissions. Uh, we can think about our, our homes and what we can do to make them more energy efficient. So energy efficiency is, is really a big thing that we can control individually and in many places. In British Columbia, we're fortunate because most of our electricity comes from, from renewable resources, but that's not the case for, for many parts of the country or, or the world. But there are lots of things that we do that contribute to putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, driving. And, and we talked earlier about buying things from a long ways away. So when that thing that you bought finally arrives on your doorstep, it's gone through, uh, uh, you know, a 
a process somewhere else where where uh, emissions were created by producing that thing. It was shipped across the ocean, then it was shipped by truck to its place, and then shipped by a delivery truck to your front door. And so there's a there's a footprint to all of that 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 we're in control of. So those are the things that I I like to think about is is what are the things that I can do personally because at least then I feel like I have some control. Whereas the things that require, you know, multinational intervention are not things that I can control. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and do you feel like those individual actions move the dial uh, enough to, to feel good about ma- making those changes? Well, I think they do. I mean, I think they, they help a, a, an individual feel like you, you have some agency, but I think it also it affects the the, the government and, and international uh, policy development uh, because people are more and more concerned about this and therefore they they put more and more pressure on their on their elected officials to do things and we see action at the international level things like the Paris Agreement which commit governments to to reducing emissions and stabilizing climate change so I, I you know I see I see promising signs awesome well one of the things I think we see in this industry, in events um, and, and weddings, but, you know, things like birthday parties and that, that kind of thing, um, is, is clients um, often will, will say, this is my one day where I do not have to think about climate change or, or how this event impacts uh, anybody else. This is my one day, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do it this way. And I, I understand that thinking, absolutely. And I, I think vendors can play into that thinking as well. Um, how can we flip the script a little bit and see weddings and events as opportunities to showcase positive action? Well, it, it is quite a, um, a privilege to be able to be in a place in this world where we can still think this is my one day where I don't want to think about that because there are places around the world that can't not think about it. They're already living through it. And so... Um, I guess I would want to see it flip by starting to think outside of ourselves and think more globally and get educated about what's going on and knowing that, yeah, thinking about all the, the, the chain of events that happen, that you, none of us are innocent, I guess, when it comes to this. And um, I don't think anymore. And so now just flipping this script to like get being knowledgeable about this, getting educated if we're not yet, knowing what we can do. Um, I don't want to see environmental, like it get trendy. Mm-hmm. I want it I want it to be like genuine. I want things to be able to, I want folks to get on board because they actually see themselves as, as part of the whole. Uh, not that they're just doing something that's trending or not that they're saying, no, I don't even want to think about it. So I want people to be genuine, to do the work and just to think about yeah, where they are, what is their privilege in the situation, um, and really start to unpack what that looks like for them. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. And I think, you know, it speaks a little bit to the purpose of these gatherings mm-hmm. is seeing ourselves as part of this whole, um, seeing ourselves and our community all come together. Um, you know, that's that's a lot of what a, a wedding's all about, right? Um, and so... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think thinking about it that way and, and thinking about the, the kind of ripple effect that that, that one day will have, um, you necessarily think about it differently, right? So, um, but but it, it will take time. And I think yeah. it, it will also take vendors saying, um, or, or, or at least pushing back a little bit about that, that kind of narrative that this is your one day, you can do whatever you want, yeah. um, right? And, and so, yeah, uh, keeping that, that broader scope in mind is, is huge for mm-hmm. sure. Um, Greg, if you had one piece of advice for the wedding and event industry, which I think is in the early stages of, of trying to reduce our footprint, trying to acknowledge our relationship to climate change, what would that one piece of advice be? Well, I think we've, we've kind of talked on it. It's hard for me to pick one because there's kind of two sides to it that we've, we've talked about. One is, is thinking about the, the, the emissions associated with everything you do, the, the travel, the things you buy, the, you know, whatever it is that you're, that's associated with that event and just, you know, not, not being depressed about it, but just contemplating that and, and thinking about what you could do to reduce that. And, and secondly, having 
you know, establishing your plans that in a way that is resilient to the potential for, for you know, extreme weather of some sort. We can't predict that whether there will or will not be a, a heavy rain on the second Thursday of or second Saturday of, of next June when you're planning your wedding. But we do know that the, the risk of events like that is changing. So making sure that you have a backup plan, that you, you have that have thought through what the implications of that would be. I think those are the two things that that seem to me, at least from this conversation, the things I would I would think about. Awesome. Although I do also like the idea of the almanac. If you two could get together and create a wedding almanac where you could predict what the weather would be on that day, I think you'd make millions. Just putting that out there. <laughs> um, Chrisanne, same question. If, if you had one piece of advice for wedding vendors or wedding couples um, to acknowledge the realities of climate change within the wedding industry or when they're planning a wedding, what, what would that be? Well, especially in, in my field with the wedding officiating, um, I would want folks to consider um, really the heart and the intention of the day and what they're likely going to take away from it. And largely, I think that would be memories. And so it's not going to be so much of how, how much did they love the food? I know that's so important, like the food and the, the specialty drinks. Um, but really, you're going to take away how it all made you feel. And so with that in mind and at the center of things, I, I think we can scale back and I think we can pare down and responsibly plan a sustainable wedding. Well, that's just a perfect way to sum up our episode. Responsibly plan a sustainable wedding. I love it. <laughs> Greg, uh, Chrisanne, thank you so much for being here today and, and talking about this. This is awesome. Thank you. We have no good way to end these, so that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Fade out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could leave that part. Yeah.